Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, great and gracious God, open our hearts. Open our minds. In these moments, help us to be attentive and receptive to your word, to your voice speaking to us. Oh, Lord, speak through me, your servant. Amen. There was only one human being who knew Jesus from the day he was born through the day he ascended into heaven, and that person was Jesus' mother, Mary. And whereas we might have it in our mind what Christmas was like for Mary, when we sing words such as, round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, reality reminds us that the joy of Jesus' birth was mixed with sorrow. It was mixed with adversity. Mary's life was a combination of blessings and hardships. It was a reality that is often true for all of us who live in this world. Throughout these four weeks of Advent, I think you are going to identify with and be inspired by Mary. I also think you are going to learn some things you didn't previously know about her. So I hope that you will occasionally jot down a few notes so that you might think about those things throughout the week. Today, we begin our Christmas preparations with a sermon series titled, Christmas Through the Eyes of Mary. Of course, for many of us, the Christmas season began weeks ago as stores replaced Halloween items with Christmas displays. This past week in particular, I noticed a significant increase in email advertisements from places like Kohl's, Macy's, Bed Bath and Beyond and more. Certainly you've probably been dealing with advertising from the same places, maybe those other places that you happen to shop more often. Upon our return from Thanksgiving Day in Pittsburgh with Peter's family, I glanced at the newspaper advertisements. I saw that many stores were opening early on Black Friday morning. It sort of seemed more like the days before COVID. Now, did any of you stand in an early morning line to get into a store on Friday morning? Did any of you? No, you didn't. <laughs> it was about 18 years ago that I got up in the middle of the night I barely slept, and stood in a ridiculously long line outside of Macy's in Pittsburgh. It was, it was my then teenage daughter and niece who had talked my sister-in-law and me into doing so. After that one time, awful experience, I became convinced that the great deals did not make up for the crazy crowds, my personal fatigue, and two cranky teenagers. But I know that there are those who are very serious about making the most of Black Friday deals, and they are out there. In 2008, the Mete Damore was a 34-year-old man whose job was stocking shelves 
at night at a Walmart on Long Island, New York. He was working Thanksgiving night, and as the store 5 a.m. opening approached, he was asked to stand just inside the big glass doors of the store. Damore was known as Jimbo by his friends. He was a large man, about 270 pounds. But just before the doors were to be open, people who thought they had waited long enough and who possibly thought, because of movement, that the store's doors had been open, began to swell and push. The glass doors of the store gave way to the pressure, and they fell on Damore, who was crushed to death as thousands of people flooded into the store over him to get their great deal on something. That horrible incident is a story of Christmas run amok, a story of people who forgot about the meaning of Christmas. This time before Christmas that we know of as Advent is a very important time for Christians because during this time, we focus on what Christmas is really about. During Advent, we are encouraged to embrace hope and peace, joy and love, that we may better engage in our mission to live as followers of Jesus Christ. This year, we are preparing ourselves by way of the lens that is Mary. And today we begin with the end. It's a challenge to preach on Mary's last years because not a lot is known. There is only one verse following the resurrection of Christ that mentions Mary by name. That verse is important, and we will look at it more very soon. But it's not a lot. So we are also going to look a bit at the tradition of the church. Now we Protestants, we tend to be leery about much of this tradition because it is not written in the New Testament that we know and read. However, our Catholic and Orthodox Christian friends are more open to the traditions that developed during those early years of the church. Two-thirds of all Christians throughout the world are Catholic or Orthodox. And they have a broader way of talking about Mary than we do. In those traditions, the death of Mary is remembered on August 15th. Catholics mostly believe Mary was taken up into heaven, both body and soul, either right before or right after she died. Orthodox Christians believe she was taken up bodily on the third day of her death. Both Catholic and Orthodox Christians believe she died in a special way, as a way of honoring her faithfulness in life. Much like depicted in the story of the prophet Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, who instead of suffering death was picked up and taken to heaven by way of a fiery chariot. If Mary was a remarkable human example of faith, of devotion, of sacrifice, which I think most of us would agree she was, then it's certainly it's not outside our faith to believe that something unusual and very special might have happened at the time of her death. However, believing in the details of traditions is not nearly as important as the basic profound point of those traditions. Mary such a resurrection. One tradition has Mary dying in Ephesus because she was entrusted to John's care by Jesus at the foot of the cross. And Ephesus is where John spent many of his ministry days. There's a little chapel in Ephesus, Ephesus built over ruins, 
and some consider it to be the place where she lived and died. Inside the chapel is a simple altar. However, most Christians believe Mary died in Jerusalem. Just past the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a chapel you can enter. Once inside, you walk down steps to an ornate altar. Many believe that is the location where she died. You know, an important thing that I learned on my trip to the Holy Land is not to focus on the discrepancies of whether a certain place is the exact place where something special happened, but instead to focus on the truth of what happened. The most important thing to remember about Mary's death is not where or exactly how she died, but that she died with resurrection hope. Today is Hope Sunday. The Advent candle of hope was lit at the beginning of the service. A very important part of the hope of Christmas is the hope of resurrection from the dead. This hope invites us to remember that Christmas and Easter are a package deal. The birth of Jesus is the birth of the one who would say, I am the resurrection and life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. The holidays, this time from Thanksgiving through Christmas, are often difficult times for those who have lost loved ones. But part of what we remember at Christmas is the hope, the hope we have because of Jesus. As Jesus' mother, we know the grief Mary experienced at Jesus' death on a cross would have been excruciating, overwhelming, Three days later, she had the joy of seeing her resurrected son, only to have him taken away from her again 40 days later. The death of Mary is dated at 48 AD, at the age of about 64. This means that she lived about 15 years following Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. What do you think Mary felt and did during those years? We know that as a mom, when a child dies, you feel as though you've lost a part of yourself. It is an excruciating pain. And yet I have known moms like Mary over the years Moms of faith, who after a while, a way begins to open amidst the pain. And the focus is less on the loss and more on the seeing of that child again. How do we get through devastating losses without the hope of the resurrection? That is the hope that allows us to experience Jesus' death and heaven differently. I don't think it's difficult to imagine that Mary would have carried with her for the rest of her life the grief of her son's death. It was an awful experience, feelings of separation. But I also think her grief was tempered by time and by hope. It's the same hope we have when facing the death of any loved one. It's our hope of resurrection and our hope of Jesus' return someday. It's our belief that we will see loved ones and someday this world will not be as it is now because it will be set right. 
this belief is part of the promise. It is part of the hope of Christmas. I can't help but imagine that the last time Jesus saw Mary, perhaps at the Ascension, he would have said something like, I will see you again someday. So what did Mary do with the last 15 years of her life? In Galatians and Revelation, there are possible mentions of Mary, but not by name. So we look to today's passage from Acts chapter 1 as the last place she is mentioned by name. And there we find some clues as to what she did those last years of her life. At the beginning of Acts, Jesus appears for the last time. He had appeared to them many times during the 40 days following his resurrection. But this last time, Jesus asked his followers to meet him on the Mount of Olives. I took this picture from the ramparts of the Jerusalem's wall about a month ago when Peter and I were in the Holy Land. Don't have the picture? Oh, too bad. The picture is of the Mount of Olives. The Garden of Gethsemane is seen as well as, as the church known as the Basilica of the Agony, which is located right next to the garden. The book of Acts says they were a Sabbath day's journey away, which means about a half mile. It really is not that far from the Jerusalem Gate to the Mount of Olives. I never quite knew how close until I was there. In Matthew 28 and in Acts 1, the final words of Jesus before his ascension are very similar. We may be more familiar with the Great Commission of Matthew, but in Acts, in a very similar way, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the mission. This is the commission. Jesus told his followers what to do with the rest of the days of their lives. Of course, they first had to wait for the Holy Spirit to arrive. So Jesus' disciples, along with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers, devoted themselves to prayer as they waited. When the Holy Spirit came ten days later, their small group spilled out into the streets and 3,000 came to faith. And from that point forward, they shared with each other as each had need. They met in the temple, courts for worship. They gathered and broke bread in people's homes. And they fulfilled the mission. This is what Mary did for the last years of her life. She did the things Jesus did. She looked for lost sheep. And for those who were hungry and thirsty, sick, naked, and in prison, and she took care of them. She let her light shine before others. I believe Mary continued to be the same courageous and strong woman to whom God had sent the angel Gabriel many years earlier with the surprising announcement that she would bear and give birth to the Savior of the world. If you think about it, it's not unusual for parents of a child who died to find meaningful ways to invest their lives in activities that both honor their child and help others. That is what Mary did as she shared her hope in the resurrection of the dead and as she worked to fulfill the mission. Those two tasks would have been a source of joy for her amidst the grief she bore for the rest of her life. Christmas is about bearing the light of Christ to others. 
So how do you think Jesus wants us to celebrate his birthday? The best way to celebrate Jesus' birthday is to do what he did. To do what Mary did. This year, we can share hope by helping others through the donations we make to Nehemiah Mission and to sponsor a family. We can share hope by responding with generosity to Salvation Army battles and by giving to any number of organizations and ministries whose purpose is to help others. Giving Tuesday is only two days away. We can also share hope in other ways as God calls us and reveals to us hurts and needs and pain and suffering both close, maybe next door, as well as far away. If we are not serving the poor and hopeless in some way during this season, then we are not fulfilling the mission and we are not doing the things Jesus once done. It was estimated that there were about 2,000 people in line at that Long Island Walmart on Black Friday in 2008. How many of those do you think were Christians? 1,800? 1,500? 1,000? Only three. Only three stopped to help the more. Only three tried to protect him from trampling feet and tried to resuscitate him. Our mission at Christmas is not to get as much stuff as possible for the people we love to open on Christmas morning. It's to be people of hope who let the light of Jesus Christ shine through us. It is to act as Jesus witnesses so that others will see him in us. On Christmas Eve, those of you who will attend the 7.30 service here in the sanctuary will get a candle. And you will light your individual candle from the Christ candle. To light your candle is to open your life to the light of Christ and to commit yourself to taking that light into the world. But let's not wait until Christmas Eve to allow the light of Christ to shine through us like Mary. Let's celebrate the hope of Christmas by committing ourselves to fulfilling the mission of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for the gift of life we find in you. We thank you for illuminating our darkness for giving us hope in the face of death, for dispelling the fear that we face, and for the confidence we have of seeing you face to face one day. We thank you for your mother, Mary. We pray that we, like her, may trust in you and fulfill your mission. Help us as individuals and as a congregation not to forget the meaning of this season. Fill our hearts with compassion for those in need and help us to celebrate this holy season in a way that honors and pleases you. In your name we pray. Amen.